Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, getting COVID under control in Canada, but can we keep it that way? What we are dealing with is, is absolutely, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's unprecedented. A surge in cases among migrant farm workers, more young people infected. Is it time to make masks mandatory? A dire situation in the United States. Skyrocketing cases in Texas and Florida, new closures and restrictions, but still, some aren't getting the message. Boycotting Facebook. This could be the first sort of crack in the armor. Companies pull their ads to try and force a crackdown on hate speech. I'm gonna kill everybody! Point your horns for me right now! Could the drive-in save summer music festivals? The Canadian artist starting a party in the parking lot. This is The National. Some good news for Canadians today about COVID-19 infections here. New federal modeling shows the spread is largely under control. But it's far from completely contained and very specific groups are driving up the numbers. One of them, people between the ages of 20 and 39 who are now accounting for a greater proportion of new cases. The other concern, hotspots, mostly in Quebec and Ontario, including outbreaks among farm workers. So that's what's happening in Windsor, Essex, Ontario. It saw 177 new cases today. That's more than double what the rest of the province reported. And as Vicodopia tells us, most of them were found on just one farm. As COVID testing came to the farms of Southern Ontario in recent days, more and more tests came back positive. 175 cases today alone, traced back to one farm and a third of its workers, adding to the hundreds of other cases on Ontario farms. What we are dealing with is, is absolutely, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's unprecedented and uh, nobody was expecting this high number. Public health officials say cramped bunk houses like this one are putting workers at risk of infecting others. Yeah. 10 to 20 men in one house, six men in one bedroom, 10 men sharing one washroom. That is disgusting, yeah. disgusting. Activist groups want the farms shut down until living conditions improve. This fiasco has to end and we can't pay lip service. We can't uh, basically, you know, tippy toe around the situation. Uh, the federal and provincial government has to enact emergency strong measures to protect the workers. Ontario is sending health care workers to help deal with the situation in Windsor, Essex County to do contact tracing and verify who's sick. Ontario's health minister insists people who test positive can stay on the job if they're not showing symptoms. We only want the people who are well, who are feeling well, they're, they're positive but they're truly asymptomatic to be going back to work. But that's not what the province's own public health officials are saying. That guidance was developed, I think, in view of having a very small handful of asymptomatic positive people. Um, we don't have a small handful in this instance. We they want to find out what's happening on the farms so, first. Uh, the outbreak has claimed the lives of three temporary agriculture workers. Ontario public health officials say if the situation doesn't improve, they do have the authority to shut the farms down. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. And there's another major outbreak in Ontario. This one linked to a nail salon in Kingston, a couple hours south of Ottawa. It is still growing. At least 27 people have tested positive so far. This has certainly been a wake-up call for our community that we have to remain vigilant, that we have to take these basic tenets of protection seriously. So the cases include at least six employees and six customers of Bins Nail and Spa. The rest are their close contacts. One of them, an employee at another nail salon. Both are now closed, but the health unit warns if more salons get linked to COVID cases, they could all be told to shut down. Now, Kingston has made wearing a mask mandatory at many indoor public places, like grocery stores and restaurants. But as Christine Birak explains, the rules on masks really depend on where you live. 
to wear a mask. Certainly that's the choice that I'm making uh, in order to keep myself and others safe. But should it be a choice? Without strict guidance on masks, a patchwork of rules is emerging right across the country. Quebec is expected to announce tomorrow that it will make masks mandatory on public transit. Mayors in the Greater Toronto Area asked the Ontario government to issue a mandatory face covering measure for indoor settings and busy outdoor spots. But tonight they've been turned down. The province says local medical officers of health can institute their own policies rules that are already in place in Ontario cities like Windsor and Kingston. We are getting uh, complaints uh, from civil libertarian organizations across North America. We're getting Trump supporters. And medical officers in Ontario have other concerns. One of the issues is enforcement. Some worry that will put more stress on frontline workers, but many doctors insist, much like the rules around smoking indoors, people will adjust and inevitably end up wearing masks. A recent poll found just over 50% of Canadians think wearing a mask when in public should be mandatory. Countries that have long worn masks, including South Korea and Taiwan, have had more success containing this virus without shutting down their economies. I think we're approaching a tipping point, but the idea is that we're basically, you know, setting money on fire by dithering. Then it seems like it's a bit of a no-brainer to do this. At Fisherman's Wharf in Richmond, B.C., new rules are now in place. We had about 10,000 people visit us in one week. For us to, uh, to manage all of that, we decided to put in the masks. Masks don't replace hand washing, but they're an added layer of protection against a second wave of this virus, which many expect is coming. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, masks will be mandatory in Kansas and Oregon soon. Many states are scrambling to step up precautions as the U.S. spike in COVID-19 cases just keeps on its sharp upward trend. In California, cases are up by 45% in one week. Today, Arizona hit a new high for hospitalizations. And in Texas, the governor described the surge as a very swift and very dangerous turn. As Paul Hunter tells us, several states are reverting back to restrictions to try to get a handle on the surge. They're calling it a public health catastrophe. Months into the COVID crisis in America and hospitals in, among other places, Texas are now all but overwhelmed by it. In the last three weeks, I have seen more admissions and sicker patients than on the previous 10 weeks. So it's been an exponential increase on the severity of illness and on the number of cases that we admit. Then again, some may wonder what did anyone think would happen in a state that early on eased rules aimed at fighting COVID. So now, a blunt reversal from Texas Governor Greg Abbott. If you don't need to get out, there's no reason to go out. In Arizona, which had defied advice to maintain restrictions, they're now closing bars, gyms, water parks, and more amid a record number of infections. You should stay. In Florida, though, with its own surge in COVID cases, pushback, with hecklers shouting freedom, targeting mayors announcing beach closures. Yes, sir. South Florida beaches will now be closed this weekend regardless. But as the crisis grows, so too the criticism aimed at the White House, where Donald Trump continues to not wear a mask, sending a powerful signal to Americans everywhere. Let the president Put a mask on it. In New York State, which enacted restrictions early on and has lately seen a dramatic drop in its cases, Trump was today slammed. The White House has been in denial on coronavirus from the get-go, uh, and the federal response has just been wrong. Said the White House today, the president has no problem with people wearing masks. They should follow local guidelines. But Trump's broad position was made clear. Even in the face of an ever-worsening national health crisis, it's a personal choice. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The NHL says 26 players have tested positive for COVID. Of those, 15 were infected since voluntary workouts began in early June. The league and the players are in the final stages of plans to resume the season. Training camps could open as early as next week. Now, Edmonton is still in the running as a possible hub city should pro hockey resume. And that could be a boost for Alberta's troubled economy. Today, Premier Jason Kenney announced a sweeping new plan to turn things around, 
Rafi Bujikanya takes a closer look. Another day, another slow lunch hour for this food truck, trying to make a go of it in the middle of a pandemic. What government can do right now, they should spend the money to support you know, people, right? There's no other way. A bold, ambitious, long-term strategy. The Alberta government will invest in things all Albertans will use, spending billions on infrastructure to build hospitals, highways, pipelines, and with oil prices in free fall, on something else too. We will implement sector-specific strategies to drive diversification, including in agriculture and forestry, tourism, technology and innovation. Alberta's tried this before. We're putting money into tourism. We're putting money into technology firms. But this time, there is one key difference, says this economist. They're still going to hope, as all governments do, that oil prices will come back. But I think in their heart of hearts, they're recognizing that's not going to happen. As for all that spending, he says the province does not have much choice. It has to take some aggressive actions. There is one aggressive action the government is fast-tracking, cutting the corporate tax rate to 8%, Canada's lowest. This will accelerate the creation of an estimated 55,000 jobs, new full-time private sector jobs. The opposition says it won't help the average Albertan corporate handout to already profitable corporations. It was not working before the pandemic and before the oil price crash, and it will continue to not work. Before the pandemic, Alberta announced a three-year plan to return to fiscal balance based on higher oil prices. That seems unlikely now. Expect another fiscal update this summer. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Canada contributed much to the international campaign against ISIS, citing its moral obligation to human rights. But a new report now accuses Canada of flouting its human rights obligations by not repatriating dozens of former ISIS members and their families. Ashley Burke explains. Years after launching their vicious and violent campaign of terror, alleged former members of ISIS and their family members have been lobbying to come home to Canada. Her basic human needs um, and rights are not being met, so it's, it's devastating. CBC News is keeping the identity of Kimberly Pullman's sister confidential out of fears for her safety. Pullman became an ISIS nurse, married an ISIS fighter. Her family says she regrets her decision and wants to come back to Canada and now lives in fear of execution. Every Canadian citizen has a right to, um, you know, a fair... Um, a fair trial at the very least, or, or to be charged with something if they're detained. These Canadians are in life-threatening and dire conditions. Human Rights Watch says many are living without adequate access to food, clean water and medicine. Of the 47 Canadians trapped in northeast Syria, 26 are children. They also bear no responsibility for the actions of their parents. So first and foremost, they are victims. This group of children includes a five-year-old orphan who saw her entire family killed by an airstrike and has been left for a year with a stranger in, in the camp. When asked about it today, the Prime Minister would not commit to repatriating former ISIS members and their families. Syria is an area where we do not have any uh, diplomats or any Canadians on the ground, uh, and therefore we work through intermediaries to try and provide consular assistance as best we can. At least 20 other countries have managed to get their citizens out of Syria. The U.S. and some European countries have repatriated children. And earlier this month, France brought home 10 as part of a humanitarian effort. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister, meanwhile, doubled down today on his government's choice to pick the WE charity to manage a $900 million student grant program. Quite frankly, uh, when our public servants uh, looked at uh, the potential partners, uh, only the WE, uh, we uh, organization had the capacity to deliver the ambitious program. Conservatives are now calling for an investigation, in part because of the, quote, well-documented connections between WE and the Trudeau family. Under the Canada Summer Service Grant, students can earn up to $5,000 for volunteering their time. Well, Canadian companies, including Lululemon and Mountain Equipment Co-op, are joining a multi-billion dollar boycott of Facebook.
They're withholding ad buys to sites Facebook owns in a bid to get it to mute hate speech. But does the campaign have staying power? Here's Jacqueline Hansen. Between the friends and family photos can lurk misinformation, extremism, and hate speech, all content that critics say shouldn't have a place on Facebook. And those critics now include paying advertisers. It's quite clear that Facebook has, has room in their ad and, and content guidelines um, to take a firmer stand against hatred and racism. Arcteryx, Mountain Equipment Co-op, and Lululemon have joined brands as big as Ford and Coca-Cola to pledge to stop buying ads from Facebook for 30 days. It's a campaign called Stop Hate for Profit that's trying to put pressure on Facebook to change. We became particularly alarmed when after the death of George Floyd, we saw in the days thereafter were white supremacists organizing openly on Facebook to disrupt the peaceful protests. We saw hateful conspiracies around the protests spreading like wildfire. Content that many advertisers don't want to associate with. No brand would tolerate that in the offline world, and they shouldn't tolerate it online. On Friday, Facebook's CEO promised some changes. If we determine uh, the content may lead to violence or deprive people of their right to vote, uh, we're going to take that content down no matter who says it. But it didn't slow the boycott. More than 200 advertisers have now joined on. And while that's just a small fraction of Facebook's millions of advertisers, it could hurt the company brand. This could be the first sort of um, crack in the armor that we've seen. But advertisers won't pull out forever unless users do as well. Advertisers go where audiences are. And as long as audiences are on Facebook, advertisers will be there. Short-term pressure by brands hoping for long-term impact. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's Privacy Commissioner is investigating Tim Horton's mobile ordering app. Media reports suggested it may be silently tracking its users' movements and activities at all times. Privacy officials in Quebec, Alberta and British Columbia are also investigating Tim Horton's, says it will cooperate. And Montreal's Cirque du Soleil filed for bankruptcy protection today. The company also announced layoffs of more than 3,400 employees furloughed in March. Productions have been forced to shut down around the world because of the pandemic. The company says it is working on a plan to restart its business and rehire employees. And another Montreal company filed for bankruptcy protection. Clothing retailer Frank & Oak has been hit hard by the pandemic. The Quebec-based store was launched in 2012 as an online brand. It has since expen expanded to physical stores across the country. So clearly, I'm back in the studio with you. Thank you for the balloons and the marching band and all that. Uh, physically distant, still safe, but good to be home. Uh, the, the marching band we do every day now. Oh, thanks. So. Nice, nice, to uh, nice to have you back six feet apart. Uh, when we come back. They could take the statue, but we really would like to keep this. This now belongs to us. Reclaiming a U.S. Confederate symbol. Up next, what the push for change looks like in 2020. Plus, a look inside Russia's upcoming referendum. He's going to be uh, for a very long time in power. What keeping Vladimir Putin in power will mean for the country. And later, a new fix from music lovers. Saskatoon, how's everybody doing on a Saturday night? From drive-ins to hybrid shows, what your next concert could look like. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. In the United States, alongside Black Lives Matter protests, are discussions about who deserves a statue in a public space. Not all historical figures are standing the test of time. So as Salima Shivji tells us, many are now up for debate. In what was once the capital of the Confederacy, that legacy still looms, suffocating for many. They represent segregation, they represent racism. That does not symbolize the United States of America. It's almost a slap in the face. There was a war, and I know that a lot of people think that it represents history. But like she said, what it actually represents is white supremacy and racism. The push for change clearly spelled out on the statue of Confederate Army General Robert E. Lee. The space renamed, reclaimed, as activists look on with hope. What makes me feel seen 
it makes as a, like a black woman living in the Confederate capital of the South, like it's, it's one of the best feelings that I've had in a long time. Enemy move. By day, the monument's new look celebrated. It's just powerful just seeing people like come out here come and come together as one. Yeah, yeah. Protest and then like the different things written. So it's kind of graphic, but it's a message. At night, a stronger message from protesters. Earlier this month, the long standing homage to the president of the Confederate States, Jefferson Davis, was pulled down and carted away. A scene repeated across the country. The target, Confederate statues and others too. In Washington, this attempt steps from the White House enraged the president. Protesters going after the likeness of Andrew Jackson, America's seventh president who owned hundreds of slaves. Four men have now been charged. Donald Trump armed with an executive order leaning into his law and order message. These vandals and these hoodlums and these anarchists and agitators. Cancel culture which seeks to erase our history. Tough language adding fuel to the debate, even though some Civil War historians also see the danger of a sweeping purge. Sometimes the movement has deteriorated into simply attacking whatever statue is available nearby, something like Ulysses Grant that led to the destruction of slavery. As the whole country grapples with a way forward, local officials in Richmond are promising this will soon be gone. They can take the statue, but we really would like to keep this because this now belongs to us. The art, she says, too powerful a sign to ignore or sweep aside this time. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Richmond, Virginia. Well, police in St. Louis, Missouri are investigating after a married couple wielded guns as protesters marched past their luxury home yesterday. Keep moving. The couple, both uh, personal injury lawyers, claimed they were facing an angry mob in their gated community and feared for their lives. The men held what looked like an AR-15 assault rifle. Protesters say they were the ones threatened as they marched past. They were on the way to the mayor's residence to demand her resignation after she read aloud the names and addresses of protesters who have advocated defunding the police. Now in Toronto today, city council looked at defunding and reforming its police. The outgoing chief acknowledged existing problems, including how difficult it can be to fire bad officers. We're just not there yet. But, but yes, I agree with you. There are times that it is frustrating when, as chief of police, you can't use the proper discipline for certain things that you are aware of. A motion to cut 10% from the billion-dollar annual police budget was defeated today. But other reforms did pass, including the creation of a non-police mental health response team. Toronto's police budget has grown by almost 20% since 2013, while social services spending has only gone up 13%. And with so much focus on the police right now, there is also growing concern about another aspect of Canada's legal system, including a lack of diversity among judges, despite a government pledge to change things. Olivia Stefanovic takes a closer look. Paul Favel is the only First Nation justice sitting on the federal court. He'd like to see that change quickly. Patience doesn't mean waiting another uh, 50 years or 100 years. Uh, patience means, okay, let's get to work. The Trudeau government overhauled the judicial appointment process in 2016 to bring in a more diverse pool of candidates. But since then, only 8% of appointees have been visible minorities, 3% identified as Indigenous. The key is getting uh, really good, exceptional individuals who happen to be diverse to apply. Uh, and then that allows, us, uh, that allows us to build a better bench, a bench that reflects Canadians. The lack of representation can have negative impacts. That different perspective, I think, could be a valuable um, insertion into our, what I regard as rigid, old, uncompromising system that is, in fact, not very helpful. Uh, in solving these problems of, especially when we look at what the real problems in most of our criminal system is today, which is uh, addictions and mental health issues. The Trudeau government says it's open doors, but experts say the requirement of bilingualism in French and English may potentially impede the appointment of the first Indigenous justice to the Supreme Court of Canada. Another Indigenous language 
should be considered an, an asset. And the fact that you don't speak French shouldn't always be seen as a barrier. As for Favel, he's paving the way for other First Nation lawyers. If I can uh, create space for four others, maybe they'll each create space for four more. A reason for optimism, even if change is slow. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. When we come back, Putin's push to hold on to power. What the country's upcoming referendum will change and what will stay the same. But first, remember Brexit? How the pandemic has made Britain's exit more complicated. Welcome back. As their country grapples with a growing number of coronavirus infections, Russians find themselves in the midst of a nationwide vote that could pave the way for Vladimir Putin to remain in power for life. Our Chris Brown has the details. In this little corner of rural Russia, you won't find any campaign signs that say Putin forever. But if there were, Ramon Gonzalez and Anna Golubov would certainly want one for their dacha or cabin. They usually live 800 kilometers away in Moscow, where Ramon is a photographer and Anna is retired. But this village is their spiritual home. They're voting yes in Russia's referendum. Yes to enshrining God in the Constitution. No to gay marriage. And yes to letting Putin serve again and again as president. Beyond resetting his term limits, Putin's referendum effectively cements conservative values and arguably xenophobia as fundamental facts of the Russian nation. The world is hostile. Strength is what matters. He's personally rewritten the narrative of the Second World War to portray Russia not just as a victim of Nazi Germany, but also of what he claims was European and American complicity with the Nazis. State TV pundit Sergei Markov, who's close to Putin's government, echoes the Kremlin talking points that only Putin can keep Russians safe. If United States, Canada, European Union will continue their hybrid war against Russia, Vladimir Putin will have to stay. Just stop dreaming about this. And Putin will leave exactly when you stop dreaming about his leaving. The Kremlin saw to it that any official no campaign was banned. Russia's communists, the second largest party in parliament, have mounted minimal resistance. Without a hint of irony, supporters of the party of Lenin and Stalin say the changes are undemocratic. Our government and our president uh, now want to see uh, our country for oligarchs and uh, he want to see in future our country with uh, robbery and uh, violence. In a recent TV appearance, Putin suggested Russia will be weakened by the search for a successor if he doesn't stay on. Russia has long wrestled with its relationship with the rest of the world. St. Petersburg was built by Peter the Great to be its window onto Europe. An independent poll suggests a lot of Russians don't share Putin's suspicions about the malign intentions of the West especially younger Russians. He's going to be uh, for a very long time in power. And of course, it's very bad for our country, for our young people, for our generation. Restaurateur Alexander Zatulivitrov fears his country is sliding backwards fast. We before COVID, Zatulivitrov owned six restaurants. He's had to close two and most of his staff are now gone. Without someone willing to make radical changes to Russia, 
he fears for the future. Фактически за 10 лет мы растеряли все, что получили в конце в конце века. То есть вот эти все наши предпочтения, все наши воззвания, все наши желания свободы и какой-то демократии, они вдруг мгновенно стали захлопываться, причем с такой скоростью, что ты даже не успеваешь отбежать. Most Russians are not especially political. The tendency, learned over decades of totalitarian rule, is to avoid government rather than engage and try to affect change. So for Roman and Anna, it's better to stick with who you know. First, I don't see anyone on the horizon. And I think it's a miracle that we have such a president. The only unknown about the outcome of the referendum will be the extent of the complacency over it. The Kremlin has even resorted to free giveaways with offers of money, cars and even apartments to get people out and to vote yes. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. In the UK, COVID-19 continues to be the top story as concerns of a second wave grow. But there's another looming concern, Brexit. You remember Brexit. As Margaret Evans tells us, negotiations are ramping back up. Remember Brexit, that old chestnut? Six months ago, it was the only headline in town. Cast your mind back. After four years of roiling uncertainty and nearly 50 years of membership, Britain left the European Union on January 31st, triumphantly so, at least for those in favor, and for the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who'd promised to get Brexit done and kept his word. But there was more to come, a year-long transition period to negotiate a trade deal to help ease the divorce for both parties. It took a global health pandemic to push Brexit from the headlines and the timetable for an agreement down to the wire again. Your average EU trade deal takes six or seven years, so the idea that we're going to do this in a year was already pretty damn optimistic. Enter Mr. Optimistic. I don't think we're actually that far apart, but what we need now is to see a bit of oomph. Uh, in the negotiations. Until today, negotiations have been mostly virtual, but no less pointed. The UK keeps on backtracking for its commitments in the political declaration. Fishing quotas are one of the most contentious issues negotiators will have to deal with when they resume face-to-face -face talks this week. Others include fair competition and Northern Ireland's border with Ireland still unresolved. It's on Northern Ireland. I think the Prime Minister was misleading during the election campaign in saying there would be no checks. Britain could still ask to extend negotiations, but has already ruled that out. That's it. We are leaving the transition period on December the 31st. That's despite pleas by many fearful of a potential double blow. No trade deal with the EU on top of economic fallout from COVID-19. A lot of businesses think that if we delayed the end of transition, it would have given them greater time to adapt. So you could adapt to COVID, then adapt to Brexit. Some critics even accuse the government of wanting to hide any Brexit-induced pain in the weeds of any COVID-induced chaos. Boris Johnson is still preaching can-do optimism. That. So let's get it done. But the Britain he's speaking to isn't the same Britain that it was six months ago. It's now a country seeped in the tragedy of more than 40,000 coronavirus deaths. And Johnson himself has been roundly criticized for his handling of the pandemic. The scars it's left behind are real. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, still ahead, checking in on kids during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to look at how they are coping with all the uncertainty and later. I feel pretty safe, the spacing's good, the setup's amazing. We were kind of tired of sitting around the house and wanted to get out. A new concert strategy for a new norm. We'll be right back. The pandemic has caused a surge in calls to kids' help phone. They're up by more than half with even adults calling in. So we're going to revisit a look at the stress families are under. Here's Joanna Rumiliotis. It helps when the sun is out, when the kids can play outside and chase away their fears. Carmen Orozano says the outbursts are sudden and heartbreaking, like the time her daughter Emma broke down at bedtime. She's just started sobbing and saying, I don't want to go to heaven. And then she just said, I don't want to be alone without you guys. And 
how to help children cope in these uncertain times. It's a struggle as they keep looking for answers and keep searching for a sense of safety. It's sad. <laughs> and uh, like, I didn't say a lot. I just kind of hugged her and said, you, you know, it's going to be okay. This is a new frontier and for many young people, a scary one. How are the calls going? So um, we are doubling and doubling again. Uh, it's Catherine Hay runs Kids Help Phone. It's getting nearly 2,000 calls a day. We hear fear. Uh, they're afraid for their friends. Um, they're worried about their mom and dad. They're worried about their sister brother. Traffic on the website is also soaring. Fear is driving it all. Last week, the number of kids in crisis spiked. Serious conversations, suicide conversations. We did 12 active rescues on Sunday afternoon. It is sobering. However resilient kids generally are, they can be so vulnerable when some of their familiar anchors are gone. When is the coronavirus going to stop? When can I go back to school? Why are people so scared about the coronavirus? Those are the kind of questions Leanne Matlow tries to answer on community talks she's been giving. If your child asks you, what can I do? Matlow is a counselor who specializes in child and adolescent anxiety. Her key piece of advice to parents, don't call this the new normal. This is not a permanent state. It's okay to be angry, frustrated, scared, nervous, worried. I think sometimes um, as parents, we forget that sometimes our job is just to listen. Yeah, good job. With a new baby on the way, Orozano is trying to keep positive too. Try to think about what we can do when everything ends. It seems to help. It's one day at a time. And on a sunny day, a brighter future can seem a little closer. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Now, since that story first aired in April, Carmen had her baby, a girl almost three months old. And she says while her kids' anxiety levels have gone down, they're definitely tired of the pandemic and want life to get back to normal, don't we all? Now, COVID-19 has now killed more than 8,500 Canadians. Over the course of the pandemic, their families and their friends have been sharing some of their stories with us as part of a series we've called Lives Remembered. Well, tonight, Julie Markham tells us about her mother, Estelle. My name is Julie Markham, and my mother, Estelle Sermon, died of COVID on April 22nd. She was 87 years old. My mom was an amazing woman. She was born and raised in Toronto, and she learned how to play the piano from her mother. And when my parents got married in 1956, the story goes they spent her university money on this beautiful baby grand piano, which my mom then used to teach thousands of students how to play the piano while she was raising her daughters uh, in, in our family home in Richmond Hill. She was a choir director and church organist, uh, bringing her gifts and joy of music to many congregations, mainly Greenboro Community Church and St. Margaret's in the Pines. Uh, she was an inspiration. We, when my sisters and I um, had to make the decision to put her in a care home, going through papers, we found her speech, her valedictorian speech, voted by her peers in 1952. Her speech was this rousing call to live your life well, to use all the gifts and the education you've been given and to uh, make the most of hard times, which she always did. And she certainly embodied all of those characteristics. In her late 40s, she went to university and earned her long dreamed of Bachelor of Music and a teacher's degree from the University of Toronto. And she went on to teach music and French in the TDSB. She brought joy to people around her, even with dementia. For many years, she was still um, uh, fun and quick to laugh and quick to smile and dance and sing and I was so grateful to be able to go in and spend the last four days with her um, so that I could be there for her and um, hold her hand once more. We'll all really miss her. Thank you to Julie for that tribute to her mother Estelle Sermon. Now we've received dozens of other stories from family members remembering their loved ones throughout this pandemic. You can watch all of those tributes on our website, cbc.ca slash remembered. The National will be right back. I'm a couple hundred miles from Japan tonight. 
John Mendez performing Lost in Japan. He shares a Songwriter of the Year Juno for that song, but the Artist and Album of the Year awards are his alone. The Junos were announced tonight in a virtual ceremony. There was supposed to be a big celebration in Saskatoon back in March, but like a lot of things, it was scrubbed because of the pandemic. Now, live concerts have also become a big challenge, and that means many musicians have lost income. Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us some of the ways they're trying to get creative. He usually performs inside arenas, but now Brett Kissel is bringing the party to the parking lot. This is the way we can bring music back, but keep everybody safe while still bringing everybody together, while still keeping everybody apart. This can work. As Kissel's band members play behind plexiglass shields, fans have to stay inside or stick close to their vehicles. I feel pretty safe. The spacing's good. The setup's amazing. Oh, we were kind of tired of sitting around the house and wanted to get out. Ottawa's Blues Fest is also shifting gears into a drive-in concert series. It's one way musicians are trying to get back to work after losing billions due to COVID-19 cancellations. So it is it is absolutely disastrous. People know that it's, it's going to come back someday, but it's going to be a very gradual return. It's going to be a much smaller business. Another strategy some music venues and bands are considering, so-called hybrid shows. Toronto's newly renovated El Macombo, equipped with high-end control rooms for streaming, is about to start hosting musicians on its famous stage. For now, without audiences. But down the line, that could change. We're, we're very hopeful that um, as, th as, th as the, the grip starts to loosen um, with social gatherings, that we'll be able to do a combination of having um, an audience here, a small audience, and stream the show uh, at the same time. For his part, Brett Kissel admits that drive-ins don't give him that direct connection to his fans. I will do my part to give more energy than I've ever given before because I can't reach you. I can't touch you. But until it's safer to get closer, this may be the next best thing. I want to hear everybody honk your horns for me right now. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, the neon lights won't be shining bright on Broadway, not until 2021 at the earliest. Theaters are offering refunds or exchanges for shows up to January 3rd. Producers hope to have cleaning protocols in place by then. 39 plays and musicals have been closed since March. After the break, how strangers came together to find a lost phone. Apparently, there's an iPhone here at the bottom of the lake, and we'll see how it goes. We'll tell you about the depths they went to find it. That's next in our moment. For most people, dropping their cell phone in a lake, well, that would mean goodbye phone and all the data on it. But not so for these folks. Strangers came together and turned this into a search and rescue mission. The story behind their mission, well, that's our moment. Whoa, we found it! Oh, it's working. <laughs> it's working! That's awesome! Great job, search and rescue complete. We use the Ontario place to launch our kayaks every day. So we were just launching our kayaks and, and going for a paddle. And then Nagesh tried to click a video of me on my kayak. Oh, nice! And it fell right into the lake and it disappeared. The first attempt was to just get a dip in the water. It was very cold. I tried. And then we, that's when uh, we posted on the Liberty Village community. and. And eventually, some of them were did recommend the, uh, the free divers. There is an iPhone here at the bottom of the lake. It was just great. Like uh, we met and then went diving, and and I was expecting like at least an hour of like searching to to find the phone. Andrew made the first dive, and he was back with the phone in like five minutes. <laughs> Amazing! The phone has been in water for three days, and then you guys found it in ten minutes, and it's working. That's. That's like a really magical story. <laughs> it is a magical story. Yeah. And a shout out to uh, Tiffany, a viewer who let us know about this. Uh, she said it's a good story. It is a good story because they didn't just have this good idea, let's call the free divers. First, they jumped in the lake to try to get it themselves. They went to Home Depot to get a magnetic stick <laughs> to try to retrieve the phone. Right, right. 
Pierre Prashant actually bought scuba gear to try to go and cut himself, ended up in the ER, and then let's call the free diver. Right. And, and, and I mean, the, the, the reason, of course, that, that he was so desperate to get the phone was the data, right? The right. photos on it. Apparently, he had three years worth of photos on his phone without backing it up. He thought a few weeks earlier, I got to back this stuff up. Doesn't do it. Drops it. In. How do you not back up your photos for three? Okay, well, I'm going to go do that too. <laughs> We should do this more often, by the way. Like this that. is nice. That's the National for this June 29th. Have a good night. Good night.